Let me invite your attention once again here to Acts chapter 13. I want to read for us from verse 38 down to the end of the chapter. If you remember last time we met around the Lord's table, I introduced this portion of scripture, but there's more here than what we were able to look at together, and I want to come back to it. What I want to preach for you on is this subject, forgiveness of sins, justification, and faith. Those are three very important words that I want you to consider with me together because they concern not only God's glory, but they concern also our own peace and comfort. Where there's ignorance, many times there's fear or there's doubt. You know how that it is. I, I remember years ago, an elderly gentleman that I came across, he always used to say, don't worry about a thing until you get the facts. And then when you get the facts, don't worry, act. That was what he always used to say. In other words, rest in what's true. Well, we can't rest in what we don't know. But knowing how it is that sins have been put away, knowing what it is to stand righteous before a holy God, certainly will then strengthen and, and comfort the heart. And that's my desire here. But let me read in Acts 13, beginning with verse 38, and you can see how strong a statement Paul makes here in this message that he is preaching. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, is preached unto you, the forgiveness of sins. If somebody is preaching forgiveness of sins through any other means than the Lord Jesus Christ alone, he's not preaching the gospel. That's about as exclusive a statement as I can find in scripture where Paul says, be it known that through this man, that's pretty exclusive, is preached unto you. Not the potential for forgiveness of sins, but the forgiveness of sins. He must have done something that so satisfied a holy God that sins have been put away on behalf of those that he represents. That's a glorious truth. But it doesn't stop there. And by him, all that believe, all that are caused to see the glory of their sins forgiven in this man, it says, are justified. <laughs> it's in the present tense in the sense of they already are in that state and will continue to enjoy it, not by their belief. My doubts and how little I see of this, my changes as times and seasons and moods and days, that doesn't change the justification. That doesn't change the reality of sins forgiven. Those things are true and stand true regardless of how I see it. You realize that in this matter of forgiveness of sins and this matter of our justification before God, it's all about how God sees it. We forget that. You say, well, I don't see it as clear as I should. It doesn't change the fact that if you're the Lord, your sin was put away at Calvary. Some say, well, I still struggle with the idea, especially in sin, that I stand just as justified before God as I ever was because of the righteousness of Christ. Well, it doesn't matter how you see it. It's how God sees it. It will affect your peace and comfort. There's no question. You'll wallow around in your own misery and guilt and, and all these thoughts that just bring you down because you're not looking to Christ. But it doesn't change the fact that forgiveness of sin is in what he accomplished. My justification is in how God sees me. How God sees me. See, and that's the piece. And it says here, by him all that believe are justified from all things. I like that too, all things. 
from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. That law is a terrible taskmaster. If you think it's a cooperation between what Christ has done and what you could do, you're going to be wearing yourself out. Just read what it says there, from which ye could not be justified. That law cannot justify you. It justified Christ because he obeyed it in every jot and tittle. And I stand justified in Christ. But if I attempt to step out and say, well, I'm going to take it on, I will not know anything but condemnation and, and death. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and what? Perish. To despise this way, to look for forgiveness in any other way, to seek justification even in my faith and say, well, that's what justifies me as to despise the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only end of any such reasoning can be perishing unless the Lord grants us repentance because there is no forgiveness any place else but in him. It's not in me, it's in him. I have a righteousness, but it's not in me. Even my best works are filthy rags, but that righteousness is in him, in him. He says, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? Those that the Jews considered dogs and second-class citizens, even though they allowed them into their synagogues if they would dress like a Jew. You realize that? To be a proselyte, you had to actually physically cut your hair a certain way and wear your clothes a certain way and show that you were really converted. Sounds a little bit like modern religion. <laughs> now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. I find that word interesting as well. You know, they followed Paul and Barnabas hungry to hear more of this glorious message of Christ and his finished work. And uh, in speaking with them, Paul and Barnabas already saw evidence that God had begun a work. That's the evidence. Faith is the evidence of that work begun. And he persuades them to continue. He didn't persuade them to get into the grace of God. You don't get into it. Like some say, I'm slowly coming into it. You don't do that. It's revealed. It's revealed. But as it is, you will certainly grow in grace in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things will become more precious to your soul and heart. You'll see more and more the necessity of the work of Christ on your behalf. And so continue in that grace. That's an evidence of grace. That's good. All right. And the next Sabbath day, verse 44, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy. Isn't that what we saw in our Bible class this morning? You know, where God is pleased to do a work, Satan is going to fight it every inch, every inch of the way. And here are these blasphemers and contradictors. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you. And that's what men in their natural state will do. They'll shove it from them. It's like when you put a Bible under someone's nose and turn it and begin to point to them scriptures that, that give Christ all the glory and salvation, what do you see them do sometimes? They'll, they'll shove the Bible back toward you. Just push it back toward you. I, I can read that for myself if I want to. Well, you ought to. You ought to. But that's, they put it, see, seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. How do they do that? Well, by looking to their own worthiness. 
The only way a person can be judged worthy of everlasting life is in the righteousness of Christ. All other is unrighteousness. But because you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so saith the Lord, so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, again, you have to be a Jew reading this <laughs> to understand the impact. Because they were the Gentiles were hated. All right. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. That's where faith falls in this matter of salvation. It's an evidence of having been chosen of God. It's an evidence of Christ having died and put away my sin. It's an evidence of having been justified freely through the redemption that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an evidence. It's not the cause. It doesn't initiate anything. It's the response. It's the fruit. And if you ever get that cart before the horse, you're in trouble. It's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. I'd say to any sitting here, you may wonder, well, have I been chosen of the Lord? Well, do you believe Christ? As I set Christ forth to you and talk of his finished work at Calvary, do you bow? It's not your bowing that makes it effectual. But if the Lord has caused you to bow, that's an evidence. That's an evidence that he died for you. That's what we do. We submit to the one righteousness of God and continue to. Continue to. It's not a one-time act. It's every time we come to the scriptures, we bow. We continue to hate every evil way. And as the Lord shows you, you repent. I would be the last to say that I have full knowledge of the things I'm preaching unto you. The Lord continues to teach me. But as he does, I bow. I bow because I want Christ to have all the glory told you before, Brother David read that in 1 Corinthians 1.30 back years ago when the Lord began to teach me. And I preached, I endeavored to preach a message in a small congregation up there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, right from that particular text. I can never have that scripture read, but what I remember, what happened? It was so vivid a reaction in this congregation that had supported me for years as a missionary. When I entitled the message, No Room for Boasting. And 1 Corinthians 1.30 leaves no room for boasting. <laughs> That's the whole point. That of him are ye in Christ, who hath been made, it's already, it's a done deal, for those that are his, hath been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You see? And I can, I've told you this story before, that preacher's wife that needed to hardly close just came and got right up in my face. Said, you did not preach the gospel. You did not preach the gospel. I said, how so? And she said, you didn't talk about man's part. And I said, well, I thought I did because it's right there in the scriptures. Let him that glorieth, glory in the Lord. That's what faith does. It glories in the Lord. It bows. And I would ask you, has Christ been made wisdom to you? Because if he has, you're going to bow. You're going to bow. These things are not going to ring strange in your ears. You're not going to have trouble believing that if, you have, if you've been saved, God did the saving. You're not going to have trouble believing that all of your salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished you're not going to be putting butts at the end of statements and trying to work this thing around to where you get just a little wiggle of the, of the glory. Now, if he's been made wisdom to you, then you gladly say, let him the glory, glory, Lord. That's what faith is. As many as were ordained to eternal life believe, right? And it says the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women 
and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coats. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. All right, so there are a number of points in here that I could bring out in Paul's message. But I, uh, I use this as a pattern. I use this, I would say that any of us that preach, any of us that stand here and open the word, we have here a sum or summary of the very points that need to be underscored with regard to the gospel. I'll just give these to you. There's six of them, so I'll move down through these. First is this, and we saw this last time. This will give an opportunity just to kind of review, but in verses 17 to 33, all of the Old Testament scriptures foresaw and foretold the coming of a Savior. So when we read the Old Testament <laughs> scriptures, if any, anybody takes these Old Testament scriptures and reads them and preaches them, that should be the emphasis, how they point to the one who is coming and by whom God would accomplish the salvation of sinners. It's all about him. All right, we saw that last time. That's the first point. That was fast, wasn't it? Here's the second one. All that the Lord Jesus Christ did from his birth to his death. Because you remember last time we saw, Paul started all the way back in this message, all the way back to the beginning when God chose out a people of Israel, showed how all those types and pictures through David all the way up. But then when he got to Christ in verses 24 through 37, here's what he was saying. All that the Lord Jesus Christ did from his birth to his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, all was a fulfillment of all of the conditions and requirements of God's holy law and justice. That's why he had to come. Somebody had to obey it. That law did not change. The law does not budge. God does not change. In order for God to show mercy, there has to be satisfaction. That's the, that's the essential message of, of the gospel. And the message is that Christ did it. The Lord Jesus Christ did it. Every aspect of his, of his uh, life and death even though I do point to you that the cross as being the fulfillment of all that was required, yet it, it began right from his birth. He had to be perfect in his nature. That's why I don't understand today how some of these are saying, well, he was perfect until he got to the cross. And then suddenly now, when God put sin of his people to him, that somehow his nature then was tainted by that sin. If that's what's required, taint it all the way back there from the womb. And in that case, you have no salvation at all. You have none. You have none. Christ did not have to redeem himself first before he laid down his life for his people. That is blasphemous. It's ridiculous. I could even entertain that kind of thought. But... Uh, we see here how the Lord Jesus Christ did from his birth to his death, his burial and his resurrection, fulfill every jot and tell. I'm thankful it's that way. I have a perfect Savior, a perfect sacrifice, and a perfect satisfaction. And when I'm troubled in myself about my sin, I'll tell you, when God gives you eyes to look there, you realize I need that. I need that. You do too. All right, so that's the second point. The third is where we picked up right here in verse 38, here's what I want you to see, that what the Lord Jesus did and accomplished by his death has resulted, I like this, in the immediate forgiveness of sins and the justification once for all for whom he died. Now, if the Lord will cause you to see that, I know it'll give you some rest. It'll give you some peace. We see here plainly the cause and the manner of forgiveness of sins, don't we? It's nowhere else but in the person of the Lord Jesus, God's lamb. That's who we're talking about here, God's lamb. <laughs> not one you brought. Those lambs that they brought could not save. 
could not put away sin. This is God's lamb that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sins. It was through his life, his obedience, but it was his death, his obedience unto death. And you see, as I've mentioned already, it's not the potential of forgiveness of sins that is preached. I'm not preaching to you a potential for having your sins forgiven if you will just do something. I'm preaching to you forgiveness of sins in Christ, period. That's where it is. It's in him. It's in him and what he accomplished. It was conditioned on something outside ourselves. Quit trying to work it up in yourself. It's outside ourselves. It's in a sacrifice. <laughs> I don't care how well the children of Israel behaved. Any hope was in that sacrifice. It was in what that priest was doing. Not what they were doing, but in what the priest was doing. And that's the way it is with us. A forgiveness already accomplished. Brother Bill read this for the men during our time of prayer before the meeting. But in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 7, if you'll just look there. How have we been made accepted in the beloved? You ever stop and think about that? Some say, well, it's by decree. God decreed it. It took more than decree. It took God decreeing it. But the accomplishment of it, the satisfaction of it, is right here. Look what comes on the heels of verse 6. In whom we have redemption through his blood. And notice what it says. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. There's no distinction made in scripture between redemption and forgiveness if if you've been redeemed your sins have been put away the ransom price has been made it's not laying in limbo your sins aren't laying in limbo until you believe no when that redemption price was paid the ransom paid sins were put away forgiven over in colossians chapter 2 we see the same thing colossians chapter 2 in verses uh, 12 through 15, buried with him in baptism. Now, again, maybe you thought that this refers to water baptism, but context is everything. Go back and look at what is the context of this particular portion of Scripture, what comes before and what comes after. Paul is writing here in verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised, that's not talking about a physical circumcision because it says the circumcision made without hands. But then it even goes further to describe the type of circumcision that he's referring to here. It's a spiritual circumcision, but don't think of regeneration. A lot of people say, well, circumcision means regeneration. Not in this context. Read what it says. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What is circumcision? It's a cutting off. Christ was cut off in the flesh. He bore the curse of our sin in his death. And in that, the body of sins was put away. It's not talking about regeneration. When the Lord regenerated my heart, converted this heart to Christ, I'll tell you what, that, that body of sin, this flesh has not been put off. It is every bit what it was. It will not die until it's put in the grave. But there is a body of sin, which by the circumcision of Christ, it's talking about his death, was put off and put away. You can see it, the symbolic language that Paul uses here. He describes it as a circumcision, but he also describes it as a baptism. Didn't Christ refer to his own death as a baptism? Can you be baptized with the fire with which I am to be baptized? A total, it, it's a picture of that burnt offering in the Old Testament, a total consumption, just like in baptism, a complete burial, an immersion into death. He experienced death, though he were just. He experienced death. It was a baptism of fire, the wrath of God being poured out upon him. But it says, buried with him in baptism, in that baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. You there, faith is what? The effect. It's the fruit. It's the result of what Christ 
suffer. And you, this is what I want to see, verse 13, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, because when he represented us on that cross of Calvary, there was nothing in me. That whole condemnation was against my person. But look here, hath he quickened together with him. And this is what I want you to see, because a lot of people read that and say, well, there's regeneration again. I want to ask you something. Were we all regenerated at the same time? No. The Lord in his grace and spirit, different times and different places, has, has been pleased to, to call out his own. But here it's talking about a quickening together with him. What's it talking about? His resurrection. That is one the one place that I can say we were all baptized together with him if we were the Lord's and we were all quickened, raised together with him. But here's the part really that strikes home now what? Having forgiven you all trespasses. <laughs> that means when he raised, those trespasses were already forgiven. When he came out of that grave, I wasn't yet born. I didn't know anything about it. Just like I didn't know anything about it being born in this world, born in ignorance and darkness until he gave me life. But I'll tell you this, my sins were already put away. That's what Paul is preaching back here when you come to Acts chapter 13. Coming back, Acts 13 and verse uh, 38. When he says all that believe are justified, it doesn't say shall be justified, does it? <laughs> if you believe, you'll be justified. It says all that believe are justified justify. That means it's already, you're already in that state. Your believing doesn't change it. It's just God's way of causing you to come to see it and believe it and rest it in the work of Christ. You know, beware of translations that make our justification the result of our believing. Men that translate the scriptures put their prejudices in there. I was talking to a man in California a few weeks ago and he was making this point. He said, well, what you're saying makes no sense according to Scripture. And I was quoting him what we have here, and he says, well, that's not what my translation says. He was reading out of the American Standard, New American Standard Version. And if you look over in Romans chapter 10, this is why you have to be careful. The reason why I use the King James Version is because I believe that of all the versions that are there, it is the version that is the most careful and is the translation that is the closest to the original. That's why we use it. You know, the originals were inspired of God. But now as these men sat down and translated this, you can see with what care, even though we find parts where, again, we have to go back to the original. But... You can see with what care these men wrote the scriptures, even where they added their thoughts as far as what the meaning was, that what they do, put it in italics. I like that. Because wherever I see italics now, I can go back and verify it for myself. Is this what it's saying? Is that the right way to fill in the, the gap, if you will? If not, it's still the original. It's still that which is our standard, you see. But here, if you look in Romans chapter 10, it says here, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This man's translation said, for with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. I mentioned to you last time, that's not what that says. When a man believes unto, that word unto means toward, it's describing the object of what he's looking at. If I were to stand here and look out there just for a few minutes, even while I'm preaching, what are you going to do? You're going to start looking out there to see what's going on. Okay, because it's toward. There's a looking toward something that's out there. That shows me right there that righteousness isn't in here. The, the believing is unto righteousness. It's toward. That's what the word is in the original. It doesn't mean resulting in. My looking out there doesn't make that car appear. <laughs> it's looking at what's there. And it's there because Christ established it. And God accepted it and already imputed it. And the Spirit of God gives me eyes to look toward. 
that. And the same with, it says, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, the confession is that salvation already accomplished. It's not my, my confessing that results in salvation. Otherwise, Christ is dead in vain. No, it, it's toward that salvation. And so back here in Acts chapter 13 and verse 39, it's saying that all that believe, Again, by the Spirit of God, causing them to rest in Christ and his finished work, because that's what faith is, believing. It has an object. It says they're being justified. That's the actual literal translation. Continuing in that state of justification, already established and accomplished by Christ's death, as opposed to those who seek justification by any obedience to the law of their own, whether it's in their walk, whether it's in their will, whether it's in their personal obedience. A lot of people like to look to their own personal obedience as evidence of being saved. No, you'll be discouraged in a hurry there. It's the obedience of Christ that's all our salvation. All right? The fourth point that I see here in this text is in verse... 39. By him all that believe are justified. In other words, all who do believe on Christ have been already forgiven, already justified before God, and their believing is not the cause of their justification. But I want to bring this out. It's not even the instrument. Some people say, well, I'm not saying it's the cause. I'm just saying it's the instrument. <laughs> now, the instrument of our justification is the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, period. That's the instrument. It's the means. It's the cause. <laughs> it's everything. And that's what he's saying, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Christ, as God, is not only the justifier of his people, who pronounces them righteous in the sight of God, but his righteousness imputed to them is the sole matter of their justification. I don't have any other justification. You want to justify yourself? Start talking about your faith. That's what you're doing. You're justifying yourself. There's something in me that justifies me before God. That, that's how serious it is. No. If I have to stand before a holy God, let the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ speak on my behalf. Otherwise, I have no hope. I have no hope. All right. Look at uh, the fifth point here in verses 40 and 41, and that is simply that all who remain in unbelief will only know the judgment of God. Why? Not having their sins forgiven. That's what it really what it comes back to. What made the difference between Judas and Peter in the end? When you stop and think about it, it was Christ. <laughs> it was his death. Didn't both deny the Lord? Don't tell Peter's denial of the Lord was any less than Judas. But the Lord said, when thou art converted, I've prayed for you, is what he told him. When thou art converted, go and tell the brother. Go and encourage and comfort the brother. That's the only thing that any of us can say here today makes the difference. It's Christ. But all who remain in unbelief will only know the judgment of God, not having their sins forgiven and remaining in that state of condemnation forever. That's why it says, behold ye despisers and wonder and perish. What, were, what was, and that's talking particularly about the Jews. What, was, what were they hoping in? Their heritage. Like so many today, looking back to their roots. We've got strong Christian roots. Same thing would have to be said. Behold ye despisers, if that's where you're looking for hope. And wonder and perish. When he says, I'll work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though man declared unto you. What was he talking about? He was building them up for the destruction of that temple, the destruction of Jerusalem. Even though it was clear that Christ had fulfilled it all, they were still going back there and offering their lambs, still doing the same thing they'd done for years. And it took the Lord completely wiping it out, putting an end to it. And they wondered, wondered, but they perished. All right, that's what it's talking about. No amount of hearing of the gospel or persuasion by the truth or commanding them to believe will have any effect because they've been left to their ignorance. 
and rebellion and unbelief. I can't tell you a more serious state of judgment than that. That we could sit under the gospel, hear Christ set forth, be pointed to that finished work, and still despise, still perish. But that's what happens when God leaves you to yourself. I pray he won't. I pray he won't. Well, in verses 42 to 52, you can read this for yourself, but it talks there about God's, what I see there is God's will and purpose is not thwarted by men's unbelief. <laughs> that gives me comfort when I preach different places. You wonder sometimes what people are hearing, but I know this, God's going to cause his own to hear. And even though Paul and Barnabas, because of this message, there was, you can see in verse 45, contradicting and blaspheming <laughs> opposition, but did it keep those from believing who were ordained to believe? Not at all. God's going to have his way. He's going to have his people. And that's just the, the effect of, of what Christ has, has accomplished for his own. You know, what a blessed truth this is for those who do believe by God's grace and spirit. I'll tell you this, the Lord knows well how many of his people have little faith. You want to stand up and testify to me today or before everybody else how strong your faith is? I'll give you the opportunity if you'd like. You'd be a fool. You would be a fool. Just stop and think since you got up this morning how little you have thought of Christ. Do you want God to accept you on that basis? I don't. So quit looking there yourself for acceptance. Quit trying to think I've got to work it up a little more, otherwise I'm going to be cast off. Even that's foolish thinking, isn't it? Now that this is the comfort to the Lord's people. The Lord knows how little of us have faith. Oh, ye of little faith. You know, we, I used to read that and criticize the disciples, but then I found out he was talking to me. Oh, ye of little faith. We're exercised in our hearts and minds, sometimes by temptations of the enemy, and it's going to be every day. By our own misgivings, who can know the heart? The heart is desperately wicked above all. Who can know it? Often calling into question whether we have any faith at all. Am I describing anybody out there? I am. That's me. But what a relief it is to such souls to be told from an authority that cannot err that all that believe, whether strong or weak, whether babes in Christ or what we would call fathers and mothers in Christ, all alike are justified from all things. How? By Christ. By Christ. That's the gospel. I pray you can find some comfort.